Hello, good morning everyone. I am Dalia McGregor, Khan Alumni 2017, and I'm excited to introduce Erchi Nojoki and also Shamari Akhil. Today they will be presenting on Voice of Student, Civil Disobedience and Race. Thank you. So um, I'm going to use my teaching voice. I already have a big voice as it is. I, I'll pop all your ears. So I'm going to stand on this side over here. So good morning, everyone. My name is Uche Njoku, um, principal of John Jay School for Law and Count Fellow. And Shamari? Shamari Akil, uh, current uh, principal of John Jay School for Law and Con Ally. So I should have. You gave it away too early. I'm sorry. So, um, as of last year, I was the principal of John Jay, John Jay School for Law, and Mr. Akil was my assistant principal. And as he just, you know, at the cat the bag, he's now the principal, and we'll get into that um, in the course of our presentation. So, the, our presentation, uh, first of all, I want to thank Claire and Brittany, because I feel like you, you're, you're dealing with the same issues in a different community than, than uh, as we are in, a community, in, in our community here in New York City, um, elementary school, high school and um, very similar com questions and conversations. So um, hopefully um, there's some tie-in there. You know? so, um, so again, thank you so much for, for your amazing presentation. Um, so um, this is a true story of mostly black and brown children picked to attend a school in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and having to confront bias and inequity. This is what happens when children stop, um, sorry, when children are forced to stop being polite and start getting real. What happened? So um, last year when, when the opportunity came for me to be, to be a con fellow, I was already ready for it. I was ready for it. Because 13 years earlier, I was an ally. So I was, years, I was like, one day, I'm gonna be a con fellow. One, I know it's gonna happen one day. So when I got um, the invitation, I was like, I know what, what I'm gonna focus on for my project because in 2019, I became principal of John Jay School for Law after spending time at um, MSTA, MS318 in the Bronx. And when I arrived there, I was told, before I even got to the school, that we have a big problem in the John Jay building. It co-locates co four schools in that building, and it's also housed in Park Slope, Brooklyn. If you're from New York City, you know that Park Slope, Brooklyn is one, arguably one of the wealthier, wealthier communities in New York City. So, I remember when I was given uh, up at the school, I was like, Park Slope, Brooklyn, I'm good. I'm an urban um, educator. I grew up in Eagle, California, I went to Eagle in high school, you know, and, and when I became an educator, I knew I wanted to be an urban um, um, school leader, I mean, first of all, an educator, and of course, school leader, supporting kids that look like me and had those similar experiences. So, in my brain, Park Slope was not part of the conversation until I started looking at the, the demographics of the school. And I was like, wait a minute, this is a school that houses mostly black and brown children. 70% of the students are um, identified as black, African American. So in there you have African, you have Caribbean students. Then 20% um, Latinx, you know, mostly Puerto Rican, then D Dominican. And then there's, there's kind of like a overlap of Afro-Latino students who are identify as, as black or Latinx. Then, um, then you had others. But the staff was about 70% white, and um, then a mixture of um, Latinx, um, black teachers, Asian teachers. So I thought, you know what, this is the school that looks like where I've led, you know, where I've worked in, so I took, I took the position. When I arrived at the school, the first day I was there, I was kind of like thrown into an, into an assembly, which I did not know what was happening. The, the executive principal announced, you know, I'm leaving, and this kids were shot, you know. I'll tell you this, I knew that this was gonna happen. And the kids started asking, who's the, who's the new principal, who's the new principal? And she asked me to stand up, I stood up, and the kids went into pandemonium, screaming, oh my God, he's black! <laughs> and I can tell you, I was, I was shocked and very uncomfortable, because I was like, okay, what's going on here? What, what am I walking into? And as soon as I, um, I'm a believer, that if I'm gonna 
work in a school community, I need to know the community. So my first week or so was just spending time with students, talking to them. And there was an ongoing theme. The teachers don't know us, they don't care about us. You know, everything they do doesn't really speak to us. And I was like, what's going on here? Because I meet teachers and they seem like they really care. But what it was was this thing, culturally relevant classrooms. You know, teachers were just teaching the curriculum and not connecting to the students. So, as a, so as, as um, I went through that year, I spent a lot of time talking to teachers trying to shift their thinking about how to approach black and brown um, kids. And um, 2019 went to 2020, and what happened? Everything got shut down. We were thrown into the pandemic, and all of a sudden we were remote. People were dying, people were getting sick. The conversation was no longer about, you know, culture, culture relevant classrooms, it was really about survival, you know. And um, many of my students lost grandparents and parents, you know, a lot of my staff members, the same thing. And so that was not the, the top of the day. But when I um, was given the opportunity to be a comp fellow going into the following year, I knew what I wanted to do, and that was address this issue. And um, that summer, this young man over here, you know, joined me as my assistant principal, and um, I, I knew off the bat, we had a lot of um, commonalities in what we thought, and I was like, you're gonna be my ally. And he was like, what's that? I was like, don't worry about it, you're gonna be my ally. <laughs> and um, so we started to talk about our project, and um, um, things shifted. And Mr. Kiel, so time. we learned that very quickly, uh, based on some of the social situations at our school, what our problem of practice was going to be. And so for us, it was what skills do school leaders need to promote diverse school cultures, showcase how the school values diversity, and strive to meet the needs of each and all stakeholders, especially students. And so for us, this meant what do we do as a leadership team to make these things happen and happen in school. But on Thursday, the 23rd, 2021, at 10 a.m., things went left. So, act one, stay engaged. Implic implicit bias. Implicit bias is a form of bias that occurs automatically, on unexpectedly, I'm sorry, I'm sorry or unintentionally, that nevertheless affects judgment, decisions, and behaviors. So real quick, we had two girls, you know, who got into it. They had their friend groups. You know this new term now, kids use my friend group. Okay, the merging of social media into reality. So two friend groups. The one girl was white, the other girl was black. You know, you start off, I don't like you, you don't like me, I like your friends, you don't like my friends. And this was happening in the virtual space. In social media. Then it got ugly really quick. It became racial. You know, and part of my language, things like fat black bitch, you know, no, you know, you dumb white, uh, you dumb white Jewish bitch. And these languages being used. The funny thing, the, the thing about it, it's not funny, the thing about it is that we didn't even know as adults what was happening. And this is all happening virtually. Okay? The kids knew about this themselves, and this was all brewing in social media until um, there was literally a, a, um, a almost fight in the classroom. The two girls had class together, and luckily it was broken up. The deans got involved, spoke to them, and um, the one thing that did happen was implicit bias you know, came into in play. The deans, you know, you know, and listen, I work with them forever and ever. They're amazing people, but they had a blind spot. They just thought these kids were just having kids' issues. You know, we don't talk like that about each other. You know, and that was the way they approached it. But they didn't dig deeper. Because what happened was the, the, the dean, who's a white female, um, and, and she not, again, unintentionally, but the black kids felt like, wait a minute, you're not talking about, you're not, you're not addressing the white girl for what she said to me, you know, what led to me say you want to say back to her. So it must be because you're white and she's white, that's what's happening, you know? So um, the deans did their best. They documented what, um, the issue to all parents, but they didn't have that deeper conversation to really try to understand what was really going on here. 
So um, <clears throat> this is what transpired. Thanks. So on December 22nd, 2021, rumors started to abound that a coalition of students were planning a protest. Eventually, a letter was emailed to the principal, it was Principal Njoku, and the superintendent, Superintendent Ross, in which students' grievances were stated along with the declaration of a student walkout the next day on December 23rd, which actually happened. Um, um. So, um, act two, expect to experience discomfort. What we realized was the walkout was our students' version, even though they didn't know it at the time, of what civil disobedience really is. Um, at a school called John Jay School for Law, you would expect that this would be something that would be commonplace. And so the lesson for us was, how do we take this civil disobedience and incorporate it into our culture? So civil disobedience, also called passive resistance, the refusal to obey the demands or commands of a government or occupying power without resorting to violence or active measures of opposition. It's usually, its usual purpose is to force and sessions from the government or occupying power. Act three, speak your truth. Restorative justice circle. Restorative justice and narrative conversations focus on healing the harm of relationships that results from wrongdoing and conflict and holding respectful conversations that separate the person from the problem. Um, so um, the thing that still sticks in my brain from that day, imagine um, 50, 70 kids in the hallway. And if you're, if you, I, I went to school in Los Angeles. We have huge hallways. We have, we have campuses. High schools. New York City, you, everything is all in one building. So we have really small hallways. And you had, I was roughly about 65 kids in the hallways. And on their knees, do I, do you bleed the same color? That was a chant that they, they, kept, they, they kept on saying, do you bleed the same color? Every time they, every time they, and they would walk around the hallways, every time they would come to a teacher, same thing, no matter what race you work, same question. And I'm standing asking myself, wow, what am I seeing here? What's really going on? But I didn't want to make those assumptions. And thankfully, our superintendent, Janice Ross, you know, who's someone who believes in the pedagogy of love and, and restorative practices, said, let's get the, the leaders of this protest together. Same day. We got him into our courtroom. We have a courtroom at John Jay School for Law. Um, and um, I was not able to be in the room because there was, one, uh, there was a young lady who was a senior who was completely breaking down. So I sat with her one on one. But what was interesting, what she said to me, the senior, and then these group of, these groups, these groups of 13 kids from various grades, the superintendent, were very similar. You're not hearing us. Yes, you say talk to us but you're not really hearing us. So we were forced to let them speak their truth and we had to listen. And some of the things that came out of their mouths were amazing. Because I mean, what was amazing about it is how simple it was. A young man, um, Jay said, Hispanic Heritage Month, we want to be in charge of that. We're in high school, I'm 17. Why can't you guys give us the money and we planned that out. And not only that, allow us to, to have time over the summer to plan this out. And you're like, oh, 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 okay, that's very true. But what do we do most of our schools? Get teachers together and say, teachers, you plan it out. Get some kids' opinion, but you plan it out. The kids were like, no, we want to do that. Black History Month, same thing. The other thing they wanted to be part of is, um, why do you teach what you teach the way you teach it? The other day I sat with some Haiti, and she said to me, all my life in Brooklyn, Every time Haiti comes up in classrooms, the teachers are telling lies. She's like, it's not their fault because the books are telling lies. 
I'm Haitian. I grew up in Haiti. I can tell you about the history of my country because I sat in classrooms and learned about the history of my country. So you know how offensive it is for me to sit in the classroom and be told untruths about where I'm from? And she's like, I know it's not, I'm not the only one, because I know other kids feel the same way. Why can't we be part of the conversation about the content we're being taught? Why? And this went on and on and on. So our theory of action. Will employing external supports, including Glenn Singleton's work, Courageous Conversations About Race, focused on student voice, improve student experience, and transform beliefs, behaviors, and outcomes so that all stakeholders, regardless of races, at John Jay School for Law can exist at their highest levels, authentic, or levels of authenticity and achievement? So one of the things that um, I need to go back to is that particular meeting with those 13 students and the superintendent, uh, she asked me to come into the room and get everything settled. And so once I got everyone in the room, I created a unity circle for students and the superintendent um, by which they were able to first identify themselves through their names, their grades, um, and um, what neighborhoods they came from. Um, and then after that, I left. Because I wanted them to make sure, I wanted them to understand that this was an opportunity for them to address the superintendent without any of the staff. And even though I was brand new to the school, they saw me at that point still as someone who represented staff. So, from that. Um, one of the things that we learned was we needed to formulate an equity team that was based on true equity. That not only was it for administrators and teachers, but students need to be on that equity team as well. So an, equ an equity leadership team is a group of committed individuals whose goal is to ensure that each child receives what they need to reach their academic and social potential. It should be noted that some equity teams are known by other names such as leadership team, school improvement team, our school, our school was school climate team. So um, our presentation is not laid with data. This is a time of what, of what happened to us. We, were, we had to become very reactionary and we um, try to figure out what's happening. Mind you, this protest happened on the 23rd. And I remember um, uh, we had a, uh, a study group um, not too long after that. And I sat, we sat there and we were talking about what was going on in our schools and how we had to make this quick shift. And um, one of the things that I, that, um, that I learned was um, I had to let go of all the things that I believed about what it meant to be a leader in the, in the school community. You know, all of us principals, for the most, it doesn't matter where you went to for your program, it's typically the same curriculum, you know. And one of the things that we're cautioned about is be very careful about letting students take over. But in this situation, I was like, what happens if you let the kids take over? Like, is, is everything going to go go to hell in a, in a, in a picnic basket? Like, what's going to happen? And um, we decided we were going to do that. But it was very painful for me because it was like me letting go of something I was told I had to control. And one of the things that I appreciated about this experience um, is that having Akil as, not just my assistant principal, but as my partner. Because we had many conversations. There were many days after school where we just lived to sit and just talk. And talk about our growing up, our experiences in Queens, in Inglewood, you know, being Nigerian, and, 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 and then reflecting on our experiences in schools. Because often as leaders we forget the things that we went through in schools that were not right. And then we become leaders and we keep perpetuating those experiences. So um, so through all of this, I think I became more conscious about the way I move and what's important. Because at the end of the day, a school is still going to be a school. But we have to ask ourselves, 
Are we really understanding the culture, not of the school, but of the students, of the community? What are they going through? Mind you, if it hadn't been, you know, December 23rd, 2021, after all that had happened with the pandemic in George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, you know, think about this. We as adults, we talk about these, these, these topics, but what are the kids talking about? And what I saw was them saying, no, no, this, we're part of this. This is, this is also about us. And they owned it, and they unleashed it on us. And at the end of the day, I felt that I became better for it. You know, I'm still struggling with that, you know, what happened in that time frame. But I know the decision we've made to really put our children in the driver's seat, you know, especially at our high school. I, don't, I can't speak for elementary school, middle schools, but at a high school where we had young adults, we knew we, we were doing the right thing. So for me, uh, this work came innately. Um, it was part of who I was even before I became an educator. My road to uh, school leadership began even before I joined the Department of Education. So it was rooted in the fact that I was working in hard to place group homes in Nassau and Suffolk County, where I was working with our most vulnerable populations, making sure that they received uh, not only the love and support they need, but also the other tangible things that they felt were important, like financial aid and all of those things. So my upbringing in this area, in this arena, was always rooted in this work. My growth was in having patience with adults who did not understand this. And my blind spot was, if you say that you are an educator and you want to work with urban uh, uh, young people in urban arenas, then this should be something that you understand. But that was my lack of awareness and my lack of understanding. And so, um, as Brother Uche has stated, you know, one of the things I had to come to grips with in our conversations was how do I move along my well-meaning, dedicated teachers, and other staff who simply don't get this, who want to do the right thing, but don't necessarily have the skill set. Uh